Okay. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Imagine all the wheeling and dealing that's gone on between here and the winning post. When it comes down to it, my son's more important to me than Arkenfield, than creditors, than a thousand winners. If that horse doesn't win, I'm floating in it. <laughs> She's a stubborn woman, your mother. She's not my mother. Do you really think we're out to destroy you? Please make sure nothing goes wrong. Absolutely. You either obey the rules or you don't. Trainer, Wednesday at 8 on BBC One. This afternoon, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont, will be appearing before for the Treasury Select Committee. Our BBC Two will have coverage in a special edition of Westminster Live. That's from 10 to 3 on BBC Two. Hello, good afternoon to you from the Look North newsroom. The Vickers defence firm has lost a major order for more than 200 of its Challenger 2 tanks. An American company has won a billion pound deal. The news has increased fears of job security at the Vickers Leeds plant, where more than 600 people are employed. The loss of the contract is a serious blow to Vickers, which had been widely tipped to win the order worth around a billion pounds. Defence experts say that in the long term, that could force the closure of one of its two plants in Leeds and Newcastle. I think it puts a question mark over the long term future. For now, they'll be working on the British Army order and trying to win other export orders. But you're looking at a, a 200 plus tank order that's gone irretrievably. That means that in three or four years' time, they'll be running out of orders. The management at Vickers say they can't comment on the reports until they've had official news from the Kuwaiti government. Meanwhile, workers at Lucas Aerospace in Bradford are waiting to hear whether they'll be affected by the company's announcement that it's shedding 4,000 jobs worldwide. Nearly 300 people are employed at the Bradford site. Yorkshire miners leaders are meeting today to discuss possible strike action over plans to cut around 20,000 jobs in the industry. The NUM meeting in Barnsley comes amid fears that 20 pits could close in this region. But Yorkshire's NUM Vice Chair, Ken Capstick, says strike action would be a last resort. Yeah, I think we're going to be here today listening to what delegates have got to say, coming back from the members as to what their feelings are. But what we're saying is that we want to protect the mining industry, even at this late stage. British Coal is expected to announce its list of closures this week. And we've just heard that Yorkshire miners' leaders have decided to recommend that the NUM ballots its members on strike action. A fifth person has died following the chemical explosion in Castleford three weeks ago. 42-year-old John Hopson from Lumley Street in the town died from severe burns in Pinderfield. We confirm to you today that in the British economy there will be no no-go areas for free enterprise. Coal will be privatised. Dawn, Gascoigne Wood Pit in North Yorkshire. Clocking on, Andy Thompson. Morning, Ali. One of the three and a half thousand miners left in the six pit Selby complex. Get here, man. Andy and his colleagues came to Selby ten years ago. Producing some of the cheapest deep mined coal in the world, they believed these pits would guarantee not just their future, but the whole British coal industry. Selby miners now regularly beat the European output record. But as the government ponders how to fulfill Mr Parkinson's promise to privatise coal, there's only one question which bothers Andy Thompson. Whether to take redundancy while it's still on offer. I don't want to find myself here in five years' time as a result of a private body moving into this industry, 
taking out everything that there is, coal-wise, making as much profit as there is possible, and then leaving me on scrap it with nothing. And I think, unfortunately, the situation suggests that I should, if it's offered to me, take redundancy. Gascoigne Wood is a drift mine running a thousand metres beneath the five Selby production pits. 43,000 tonnes of coal a day are brought to the surface on a 12 kilometre conveyor belt. After washing and grading, the coal is loaded onto trains. They leave for the local power stations every half hour, day and night, five days a week. Selby's first years of productive existence were fraught. First, there was serious flooding. Then, a year-long strike. But now, Selby is close to its production target. 10 million tonnes of competitively priced coal a year. But the management want to do even better. They can be more flexible um, in, in the way they go about the job and working with each other in teams. Um, it is new ground for us, but I'm sure that the, the people, the workmen in Selby, uh, will, will help us to get there. Andy Thompson and his colleagues may succeed in raising productivity and cutting costs, but will it be enough to save their jobs? The Selby pits are surrounded by three coal-fired power stations. This is Egbra. It represents British Coal's biggest customer, the electricity generating industry. Two years ago, the industry was privatised. The two biggest generators, PowerGen and National Power, were free to look for their energy wherever they liked. They decided to reduce their dependence on British Coal and go instead for gas. Of 28 proposed new power stations, all but one nuclear plant will be gas-fired. Gas plants like Killingholme are cheaper and quicker to build than coal stations. They cause less pollution, take up less space and need less people. But the dash for gas will reduce the market for British coal by 40 million tonnes a year. British Coal Chairman Neil Clark. First of all, it's uneconomic. Um, I think the price of electricity to the consumer from building new gas stations will be higher than running the modern existing coal stations. No dispute about those figures. Secondly, it's unfair. It's unfair for this reason. The gas stations require 15-year contracts to uh, buy the gas, operate the station and sell to the consumer. That means that they run at base load. That means that they push coal out of the base load requirement. Uh, they have 15-year contracts. The best we are likely to get because of the limits of the franchise market is five. That is, that is not fair. I think it's also unwise because it's using a more finite resource. The dash for gas means coal-fired power stations like Elland in West Yorkshire are now being decommissioned. Stations which can produce electricity cheaper than gas. All the gas stations, not just the very expensive ones linked to higher gas prices, which was coming in now, but even the early gas stations are going to be more expensive than coal stations. From a point of view of cost, it's a load of nonsense. So if coal produces cheaper electricity than North Sea gas, which will run out in 20 years, why are the generators, charged with reducing energy prices, going for gas? The generators are interested in building gas-fired stations because already the regional electricity companies are building gas-fired stations. And the regional electricity companies are building them to hedge against having to buy all their electricity supplies from PowerGen and National Power. As this day, decade goes on, the protected market for the regional electricity companies is going to be broken up. So they've got to find a fuel, an alternative fuel, an alternative electricity source to that which has been produced by what are going to be their competitors, National Power and PowerGen. So it was a hedging mechanism to buy into gas. And in order to make sure that all the cheap gas was, was bought up, the, reg the regional electricity companies were followed into that market by National Power and Power Gen. That's why it's happened. Andy Thompson and his family have a shared love of motorbikes. Many leisure hours are spent tinkering and tuning. But Andy can't forget that his livelihood and his hobbies depend on the generators and the regional electricity companies 
and the amount of coal they turn into electricity. But there's another threat to Andy's peace of mind. It lies 200 miles away in Rotterdam. This is the international spot market. Here, coal from countries like Colombia and China, with lower wage and production costs in the UK, awaits a market. Often, this coal has been dumped to be sold on at less than its production cost. When that happens, British coal can't compete. Last year, Britain imported 15 million tonnes of coal. International coal is cheaper for two reasons. One is it's geologically much more favourable. It's uh, thick seams, some of it outcrops on the surface, some of it is not far from the surface. In some industries like South Africa, labour costs are very low. Combined with that, the ocean freight of moving coal from Australia to the UK is, is less than moving it by train from a mine down to the southeast of England. The generators not only have plans to buy more coal, they're all in, already investing very heavily in coal imp importing facilities, which will lift their imports from roughly 6 million tonnes last year to um, well in excess of 30 million tonnes if existing plans go ahead. So they are committed and put their, have already put their money into the investing market, into the importing market. The combined effects of imports, gas and subsidised nuclear power will become clear within 48 hours when British Coal announces the closure of 30 pits. The closures will take place in two stages. 20 pits will close immediately with a loss of 20,000 jobs. They will be followed over the next two years by a further 10 pits and the loss of another 10,000 jobs. There are 48 pits today. In two years there will be 18. Four in Nottinghamshire, nine in Yorkshire. Today's 41,300 miners will become 16,000. British Coal wants to end the uncertainty about the size of the industry caused by its stalled negotiations with the generators for new five-year contracts. But even if the negotiations succeed, the 65 million tonnes now bought by the generators will be slashed to 40 million tonnes in 1993 and 30 million tonnes or less in subsequent years. But British Coal's chairman remains bullish. Well, let's take the sort of industries it might be, and these are round figures, but let's take an industry that is producing between 40 and 50 million tonnes of coal a year. By world standards, that is a very big coal company or companies. Um, it will be a very efficient coal company because the gains in efficiency, the gains in, in performance are enormous and they will continue. So I believe, although it may be smaller, it will be a viable industry and it should offer a very good future for those who work in it. In Yorkshire mining communities like Hatfield, where the pit is likely to close, there is less optimism. The pit provides 435 jobs in an area of high unemployment. NUM representative Dave Douglas believes this week's closures mark the end of any relevant British coal industry. Well, there's not a change of policy, there will be no coal industry left in Britain. There'll be a little bit of open cast mining where people haven't objected to it. There'll be a few licensed mines, tatey pits as we call them, where you go down on the end of a bucket, uh, you know, <laughs> where you pick and shovel um, for, you know, a very insecure domestic market or for the odd yuppie in London to have a real living fire. Um, but as an industry and as a mass industry, we'll have gone. Working at Gascoigne Wood in the profitable Selby complex, Andy Thompson would appear to be under less threat. But according to Gerard McCloskey, nobody in the coal industry should feel any confidence about a long-term future. It's not just a few gas stations that are going to be coming in after next year. It's gas stations coming in and more imports coming in as the 90s progress. So that by the end of this decade, well, 1997-98, you'll probably see, unless something is done by the government to stitch up the regional electricity companies, you'll probably see about eight mines operating, uh, just a fraction of the, of, the, of the roughly 50 which are operating today. That's the risk. As they ride into that uncertain future, those still working in the coal industry feel only injustice. They argue they've done everything that's been asked of them to cut costs and reduce the workforce while increasing efficiency and competitiveness. When the industry was nationalised in 1947, the output was one tonne per man shift. Forty-five years later, the figure is six tonnes per man shift. In Yorkshire, in 1984, before the strike, 52,000 miners produced 26.3 million tonnes of coal. Last year, 
with a workforce reduced by 75%, the figure was 27.7 million tonnes. Profitability too has escalated. In 1990, the profits for British coal were £78 million, up to £170 million last year. Uh, the coal industry is in a, a very healthy state at the present time. If you look over the last five years, costs have been reduced by 33%, productivity is up by 150%. Um, this last year, for example, um, productivity increased by 13.1%. There is a view expressed that if costs continue to fall as they have been doing, then the industry is going to be fully competitive with internationally traded, traded steam coal within the next couple of years. Its last orders at the Thorpe Willoughby Sports and Welfare Club in the heart of the Selby Coalfield. Andy Thompson and his friends are talking about their faded hopes. Yeah, I don't think we've been sold down ever. We've, it, uh, we've, we've made to feel like industrial gypsies. I moved from a, from a, a house where I, had, I lived at Julesbury to a house over here. And when there's no work, when there's no work for me in, uh, for British coal underground over here, there's no work on, for any sort of industry. We weren't pressured into coming out, but we, they made it look rosy. Said that your sons would all have a job to go to, so, you know, you tend to move out here to do the best you can for your family. I don't regret moving out. Uh, it's been better for me, children, schooling, and this, that, and other. But none of my sons got a job at the moment, you know, which we were sort of said, you know, this was the idea of moving out, because you try to pass your skills and what you have on and let them carry on after you, but it just hasn't worked out that way. I, I don't think there is a future in the foreign mining industry as big as it is now in this country. And probably in 10 years' time, I don't think we'll have a mining industry at all. I think it'll be history. There's going to be a potential buyer comes in. They're going to buy it. They're going to rape it. And then, <coughs> excuse me, and then they're just going to abandon it. And it might take them 10 or 15 years, and that will be it. It will be all gone, and it will be history. Do you accept you have a morale problem? Well, when I go to individual collieries, I'm normally immensely encouraged by the drive and the dedication of everybody on that colliery to survive. And I think it's remarkable. Um, and it's actually a great credit and a great tribute both to the colliery managers and everybody on the pit. What we really have is an uncertainty problem. And it's quite understandable that people are desperately concerned about the future when they know that the number of pits will inevitably decline. Um, and that is a problem that needs to be cured as quickly as... ...strippers, there's also the risk of foreign mining interests after a slice of British coal's market. To counter both these threats, Energy Minister Tim Egger has indicated the government will look favourably on worker management buyouts. I'm therefore very glad to be able to tell you today that in the right circumstances, the government will provide financial help to a management and employee buyout team to help towards the costs of putting together a bid and participating in the tendering process. First to take the hint has been the Nottinghamshire-based Union of Democratic Mine Workers. Spurred on by the imminent closure of eight pits in the county, the union has put together a deal with East Midlands Electricity to buy pits in Nottinghamshire and Yorkshire. UDM President Roy Link has had to overcome an instinctive aversion to market forces. We believe the coal industry is a, a natural resource. It should be utilised for the country and not for individual profit. So we're against it. But we're also pragmatic enough to realise that if someone's going to buy it, it might as well be the men who work in the industry, not one of your capitalist entrepreneurs are going to come and rape the industry. The first thing is that it has to put to, together a credible consortium uh, to buy whatever it is that they want to buy. Uh, that means uh, getting credible management on board. Uh, it means bringing the goodwill of the workforce, which is going to be very important, which is why uh, I see the, the UDM in particular as credible players in this. Uh, and they will need to have uh, adequate financial plans uh, 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 which will have to meet all the rigours of uh, normal city financing tests uh, to make the thing work. Uh, but I do believe that the commitment of the workforce is an essential ingredient in putting together a successful package. 
Well, I'm confident we've got the money to buy the... In Not only opposes any NUM involvement in worker buyouts, he will also try and persuade the union at a conference on Thursday to take industrial action against pit closures. We're talking about unemployment levels that will go over the four million mark in overall terms in Britain, but in the coal mining industry and its areas, it will be absolutely devasta devastating. And as far as we're concerned, the only thing that can preserve not only jobs now, but the jobs of those sons and daughters of miners yet to come, means that we've got to take action to defend our industry. Eight years ago, Mr Scargill's strike call was heeded for 12 bitter and divisive months. Now there is little evidence that he has sufficient power to divert the government's plan to close pits and sell off what's left. A more potent element in the debate over privatisation is the likely cost. Industry experts have come up with unofficial estimates which show a massive bill. If 30 pits close, the cost of new and existing redundancy packages could be £1 billion. Claims for subsidence, accidents and pollution could cost £2 billion. Cheap coal concessions for miners past and present, another two billions. Making safe closed pits, one billion pounds. Settling British coal debt, another billion pounds. Financial help to former mining areas, combined with lost tax revenue and extra social security payments, another billions. The total cost of preparing British coal for the market, eight billion pounds. The anticipated sale price, half a billion pounds. The River Don near Peniston, an example of a sort of expensive problem which will flow in the wake of privatisation. Old mine workings pouring out an acidic mix of iron, heavy metals and aluminium. We asked Leanna Stupples of Friends of the Earth to assess the damage and the wider problem. Well, first of all, there's the direct toxic effect to the wildlife in the river. Um, aluminium, iron and also the acidity of the water can directly affect the wildlife. But also you can see the way that the riverbed is getting covered with a kind of sediment on the bottom. And that can block out the light, the plants can't grow, the insects that feed on the plants can't get enough food, in turn the fish can't get enough food. And you can see this kind of a, a knock-on effect to the ecosystem here, simply because the riverbed is getting covered in silt. As the law stands, neither British coal or any future private owners of the industry will be liable at law for pollution from closed mine workings. Now that's crazy because that's sending all the message to the potential polluters out there. It's okay to pollute, don't worry, you're not going to get in any tr tr trouble. Now the problem is that every other industry does have to go along with those laws. Every other industry can be held liable. Why is the coal industry being separated out? It's got to be made explicit that the companies will be held liable for the pollution. And that has got to be in the law and it's got to be up front so that, for example, they can't just abandon a whole lot of mines before privatisation occurs and thereby wash their hands of the problem. The environment is going to have to pay the price. Perhaps a drinking water source down the road is going to have to pay the price. The fish are going to have to pay the price. There's no way that the polluter shouldn't be held liable for the pollution which they have caused or permitted. Poisoned rivers are a small part of the government's problems as it struggles to get this privatisation right. The omens are not good. British coal is being prepared for a sale which could cost the taxpayer 16 times more than it brings in, which runs the risk of dispersing a skilled and committed workforce and abandoning a natural energy source which could last for 300 years. Does the government have an energy policy to match the problems? I think a lack of an energy policy usually means that things aren't happening as you would like them to happen. Um, I think that we are perhaps unduly short-sighted I think the dash for gas, the very heavy subsidy for nuclear, possibly the way in which the electricity industry is now structured, um, show that there is some room to bring these items more closely, more cogently together. We're now sowing the seeds to ensure that we are going to be a major importer of energy. Oil when oil runs out, coal because of the decisions that's been taken now, gas when gas runs out. And because we'll have closed the mines, we'll be able to do nothing about that problem. There'll be another 1,000 million at today's prices on, the, on, our, on our import balances that we can do nothing about. Leaving long-term decisions to the market is leaving long-term decisions to a moron. At Thorpe Willoughby Sports and Welfare Club, there is little anger, just resigned acceptance of what most miners now regard as the inevitable. Probably 90% of the people that you talk to today with a regard to the future of the industry would say we can't see a future 
because there is no guarantees. And as a result of there being no guarantees, people would sooner go out with redundancy now than wait, say, five or ten years and finish up with a state redundancy payment that would be far, far less than the actual redundancy terms that have been on offer up to press. The second programme in the series Fears for the Black Stuff can be seen on Monday the 2nd of November at 10.40 and will examine what happens to a community when a pit closes. <laughs>